some things from the model. It's like when you go up and scale, you're like, oh, well, that doesn't work. Using ceramics as a medium means you have to be flexible and you have to expect the unexpected in some senses. When I started my bachelor in ceramics, I saw a lot of students building these large sculptures um, at the same place where we've built ours. Uh, and since um, apparently it's one of the few places in Scandinavia where you can actually complete a project of this size, uh, I think it's a real draw to a lot of students. Uh, Wasa and Iliana and Maya were like very, uh, the, the driving force in making this course happen. Um, and everyone was just kind of relieved and happy that it was actually happening and we were going to get this opportunity uh, to do this. Vi brukte ganska lång tid på att finna ut hur vi ville ha kurser och eh, vad som skulle vara innehållet och diskutera oss emellan i hela eh, gruppen på något eh, på vad vi alla önskar att få till. Så jag vill bara riktigt gärna pröva det. Det tror jag liksom hänger samman med att det är möjligheten för att kunna bränna så stora ting. Att så därför så är det också eh, säkert något man gärna vill göra. Sedan vi då inte hade eh, lärare i utgångspunkten och ingen av oss har erfaring med att bygga stort, så fann vi ut att att vi tränger att få någon information från någon som har mer erfaring än oss. Så kom Sofia eh, in og kunne hjælpe som gæsteunderviser. Hun jo selv er student her og jobber stort, og at hun har masser af erfaring, og også selv havde et ønske om at undervise i at bygge stort. Så der blev det lidt sådan naturligt, at hun kunne ta en dag med oss og rett og slett bare gå igennem de rene tekniske udfordringerne, ting man må planlægge kanskje mye mere, når man bygger stort end når man bygger lite. I think that I use a lot of time to develop different ideas. So I decided to make um, four separate small scale models um, and I just modeled them in my kitchen uh, using one basic shape which I then altered um, in different ways. I ended up with four different uh, designs. So from those four designs I chose one that would have a nice balance between edges, smooth surfaces and the empty space. I blir jo på en måte utfordring eh, når man skal ha en form som er så eh, perfekt på en eller annen måte mm. og få det til å faktisk bli helt smude overganger. It's quite daunting to choose one idea, um, to use all of this material and time for. The most important thing is to use your eyes and take advantage. When you are on the building, it's the perfect way to go up. It's kind of a very rare opportunity to be able to actually make something this large and at this scale. I'm doing this for the experience, and if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. And I think that's often like a philosophy that you have to have with clay. Or at least um, if you don't, you will get very disappointed because clay does have a mind of its own. I think that the video can actually help you to have so many different forms. Så leverte hun da inn i skissen. 
Så den lille skissen her er da utgangspunktet for den 9 meter høye og 7 meter brede fra kne til fot. Skulpturen dere skal ut og se på der da. So I think it was really, really useful to go and visit the small scale model of the mother before we started the project. Um, because then we could really appreciate that in scaling up from a model, there are many properties and qualities that are gained, but also many that are lost. Um, so it ends up being a compromise between your original plans or expectations and reality, as it were. There's always a trade-off. I learned that the model is a lot more important than it gets credit for. <laughs> We're used to be able to move the clay around, but now it, we are the ones that have to move around the clay. And you just have to kind of have a little bit of faith that you kind of set the right foundation. It's kind of a completely different way of working and thinking. And you have to plan in a different way and think in a different way because it's just so much larger. There were different levels of planning. Uh, some people were very like, oh, I'm going to make this and I'm going to make that and it's going to be this high and this large. And then some people were more like, well, I kind of want to go with the flow. see the results right away and it takes time and there's a lot of waiting in a way with these large sculptures it's kind of more of a marathon than a sprint and then maybe at the end you'll yeah, have the final sprint And then I also took Jenny's advice <laughs> to build a separate sculpture alongside, uh, given that it's a project that takes a long time and um, you can't rush it. So I, I chose one of the other designs to make a smaller scale sculpture. I think the biggest challenge for me uh, was the maybe mental challenge. You have to have a lot of discipline, but also the pressure. Then there's the physical challenge of working um, on the large scale every day, many hours a day. Um, you're physically obviously rolling the coils in my case, um, or extruding in Yanni's case. been really challenging uh, especially when it's wide and you kind of have to be in the middle and kind of like hang over it I mean something changes when it's larger than yourself you were kind of processing the amount of clay that you would maybe use in a year maybe in the span of four weeks after a few days you kind of get a lack of energy because of just the sheer amount of clay. I think I wasn't prepared for how addictive it would be to build large scale <laughs> in ceramics. It always seemed uh, a sort of scary thing to be doing but once you start uh, you can't think about anything else. You go home you're thinking about the sculpture, Is, has it dried too much, has it cracked? Your life ends up being um, orbiting around your sculpture. It's kind of nice 
not going through it alone. And then sometimes you're tired and someone else has energy that day and you can kind of lean on each other a little bit. After we moved the big sculpture, there were some cracks at the bottom. It was a pretty immediate feeling of, this doesn't look great. The, the glaze that I chose was relatively viscous and relatively thick. The whole point in choosing a glaze for this scale is to find one that isn't too runny, isn't too thick, isn't going to flake, and isn't going to create weird sort of lumps on the surface. So I did 52 tests of glazes and I chose the one that was the closest to the colour and texture of a traditional Japanese celadon. But I developed my own recipe and I wanted something that would be um, viscous enough to paint on uh, by hand. Um, the perfect texture was kind of like a double cream texture, if you want to use that metaphor. So if it had been like milk, then it would be too runny and it could create problems. Whereas if it was like Greek yogurt, then it would definitely create lumps and bumps on the surface. Once it's on the sculpture, um, it should melt evenly and not run all the way down. So I wanted something that was relatively opaque, but slightly transparent. So the original texture of the clay is still slightly visible. So I spent about two months developing the glaze <laughs> before I chose one and I had several tests of different sizes. I, th I think that almost took longer than the building process. When you fire ceramics, uh, cracks have a tendency to get larger rather than smaller. Uh, and since the vertical cracks and the horizontal crack was quite large and it was coming across right above them, I figured they would kind of meet so I decided not to fire the large piece. I figured it's better to recycle the clay. We decided to uh, do a demolition. Then Knut said, well, I could just use the truck. spectacle <laughs> to see it come down um, and I mean it was exciting I think and almost a relief yeah When I saw the, uh, the rip, I was really heartbroken <laughs> because you spend so long building and I'd already fired it once and it all seemed fine. I was more worried about the glaze than anything else and I kind of took it for granted that the form would be intact. But of course with ceramics you never know what's going to happen <laughs> and you have to be prepared for heartbreak a lot of the time. I talked to some of my tutors about it and whether it would be safe to exhibit it, and if so, how. I saw that there was a way of keeping it upright, 
Probably the most nerve-wracking part of this process has been the transportation. So we needed to use the forklift um, to be able to move the sculpture off uh, the kiln shelf and onto a pallet to then be dragged into the gallery space and now it's on display as part of our graduation exhibition uh, and it's in the centre of the gallery space which is called Sailukin 1. I would definitely do this again and I don't regret anything. <laughs> I've learned loads from building in the scale. It's probably the longest running project I've ever made. For me, I think it's been nice. Like one of the nicest things has been working in a group, like in kind of working as a class, like together in that space and being in that area together is kind of like a reassuring. I'm very proud of our group um, that everyone has managed to uh, fulfill their project and also that we've been able to support each other so well. me we